We're going to be in Revelation 8 and 9 this morning as we continue our study of the book of Revelation. If you are old enough, you will remember that in 1980, an active volcano in Washington state erupted, uh, Mount St. Helens. It was a huge eruption. It was a catastrophic event in many ways. Something like 55, 57 people were killed when the volcano erupted. Uh, about a billion dollars worth of property damage. Uh, we don't know when it will erupt again, but they say that the day will one day come. Uh, before the volcano erupted in 1980, there was warning. There, were, there was lots of warning. If you were living near the mountain, you would have felt the ground moving underneath your feet. There were preparatory earthquakes uh, that people felt as the volcano prepared to erupt. There actually were also flames that shot out from the top of the volcano, which served as a warning sign that you should probably move away from the mountain. If you see a mountain shooting flames from the top of it, your best bet is to keep your distance. And so the authorities and the media and everybody began to warn people, you need to get away from the mountain. You need to evacuate before it erupts because if you're here when it erupts, it will certainly claim your life. And so most people did evacuate from the area but there were some who did not. One of the most famous people who refused to evacuate was an older man by the name of Harry R. Truman. No relation to Harry S. Truman, the former president, just a coincidence. Harry R. Truman uh, owned and ran a lodge about a mile away from the base of the mountain, Mount St. Helens Lodge. Uh, he had been born in the late 19th century and had lived kind of a rough life. He was a a bootlegger during Prohibition. He smuggled uh, alcohol up from San Francisco into Washington State. He was well known for poaching on Native American land and fishing on Native American land illegally. Uh, he was a stubborn guy. He lived on the edge of the law. He was uh, notably married three times. His second marriage didn't last very long at all because his conflict resolution method, when he couldn't win an argument, was to pick up his wife and toss her into Spirit Lake, even though she could not swim. So after a not very long period of time, she decided that she was going to uh, move away from that environment. So this is the kind of guy Harry R. Truman was, and so in the, in the, in the months leading up to the eruption of Mount St. Helens, Although he was warned, he would not evacuate. He was quoted as saying this, and I quote, the mountain is a mile away. The mountain isn't going to hurt me. And quote, you couldn't pull me out with a mule team. When there were earthquakes due to the volcanic activity on the mountain, uh, instead of taking that as a sign to get farther away, he simply moved his bed into the basement so he could sleep better and not feel the earthquakes. He became somewhat of a folk hero for his refusal to heed the warnings. But of course, it did him no good. His stubbornness did him no good in the end because when the volcano erupted, he perished along with some 50 other people who refused to evacuate from the area. And when I read that, I think, man, what kind of stubbornness do you have to have to see all of these cataclysmic warnings and double down? and say, I can win against a volcano. I can win against the natural order. I can win against forces that are way more powerful than I am. What kind of stubbornness does it take to die rather than to yield? I thought of that as I read our passage this week, Revelation 8 and 9, because we're gonna see that type of stubbornness, the same type of stubbornness that Harry R. Truman exhibited, except on a worldwide scale. As we move through Revelation 8 and 9, we're going to be moving through a period of the book of Revelation in which there is judgment after judgment after judgment. God launching judgments upon the unbelieving world. God launching judgments upon people who refuse to submit to him, who refuse to bow the knee. And so the earth itself is undergoing this sort of cataclysmic shaking. And yet the majority of the world, they say, I will not submit to God. I will not bow the knee. And they say, I would rather die. I would rather spend an eternity in hell than bow the knee to God. We're gonna be in Revelation 8 and 9, as I mentioned, and let me give you a reminder of where we are 
in the book. If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, we said we're beginning this period of time known as the tribulation period. Now, if you weren't with us a couple of weeks ago when we walked through why we believe in this layout of end times, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that sermon from Revelation chapter 6. But what we talked about is how we hold that the church will be raptured. Those in this age who believe in Jesus will be raptured prior to that tribulation era. And then there is a seven-year tribulation period in which God will be judging the unbelieving world, but also people are gonna be coming to Jesus during this period of time. Ben talked about that last week in Revelation chapter seven, that there will be Jews and Gentiles alike who will see what God is doing and they will repent of their sins and they will fall on their knees and they will believe in Jesus and they'll be saved. In fact, I gave Ben a hard time this week because last week he got the fun passage. There are people worshiping around the throne and 144,000 Jews sealed uh, on their foreheads as Christ's people. And it's this beautiful passage. And I did the seal judgments two weeks ago and now I do the trumpet judgments today. And I was feeling a little insecure about that. You guys are gonna think I'm the judgment guy by the time we get through this section of Revelation. But we're gonna see that these judgments are not, they're not random, they're not arbitrary, they're not purposeless. But quite often, the judgment of God is, is a final attempt, a last resort to get people's attention. To say, as long as you are still here, despite the cataclysmic nature of what's happening around you, there's still an opportunity for grace and mercy. And in fact, the only place to find grace and mercy, the only place to find shelter is in God himself. When we read these passages, a lot of times, uh, I think some of us were tempted to ask why. Why is God doing this in the world? Why are these passages in the scripture? We are in a world and in a culture right now that is very uncomfortable with the concept of retributive justice. We're very uncomfortable with the idea of punishment, that those who do wrong deserve to be punished, deserve justice. But what we're gonna see as we move through this passage is that God's judgments serve a purpose. And in fact, when we talk about the love of God, here's the deal. God cannot be fully loving and righteous if he's not also just. Remember that through the book of Revelation, we're seeing how God is going to create a kingdom. And the end of this book is gonna be good. We're gonna get to some happy passages toward the end of Revelation, where God is gonna create an eternal kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace and love and grace. But that can't happen if evil and injustice and abuse and violence and immorality and idolatry are allowed to run forever unchecked. Love requires justice. Righteousness requires judgment. And so as we read this passage, we're gonna see God has purposes in his judgments. And, and this passage, a passage like this, I, I read it this week and I think it is gonna call us to ask a question or two of ourselves. One is simply this, do I take God seriously enough? Or do I primarily see God uh, like kind of the movie God? He's a kindly old man with a white beard who winks at our violence and immorality and sin, who says it's okay, and who never judges, but always indulges? Or do I recognize that part of God's character is his justice, and if, if we see that and we recognize that reality and we see that God is infinitely patient as well, infinitely merciful and loving, and as we've seen, he waits and he waits and he waits for the maximum number of people to come to him, and we see that, and yet we also see that the time will come when eventually God must judge in order to be consistent with his character. As we see that, does that motivate us to pray for those who don't yet know him, to share with them? who don't yet know him. We'll see in a passage like this, God won't be mocked and God won't be ignored. His judgments serve a purpose even as they are difficult to read about. 
So that's what we're going to look at this morning in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. What purposes do God's judgments serve? What do they accomplish in the flow of his plan? I want you to begin with me in Revelation chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, just a reminder, again, this is the second set of three sets of judgments in the book of Revelation. There's the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The, each set of judgments flows from the one before it. So these trumpet judgments flow out of the seventh seal. The seventh seal that Jesus breaks is the trumpets. We're going to see when the seventh trumpet sounds in a few weeks, the seven bowl judgments will come from that seventh trumpet. So these are telescoping sets of judgments. So we're in the second set now. So Jesus breaks that seventh seal, and Kenny mentioned this a minute ago. When he breaks that seal, there is silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now remember, up to this point, everything in heaven has been really loud. We've talked about that for a few weeks. There are always people singing and shouting and angels flying around and all kinds of noise. And we talked about how uh, heaven is a generally noisy type of place. You're not going to retire in quiet and peace if you're in heaven. All right, but all of a sudden here, it gets quiet. And it says there's silence in heaven. And there are seven angels standing before God and seven trumpets are given to them. Why is there silence in heaven? Well, we're going to see in just a moment why everybody gets quiet. Here it is, verses 3 and 4. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. It gets quiet for two reasons. They're anticipating what God is about to do, the judgment that is about to come. But notice, just like we saw in Revelation chapter five, there's this incense going up before God, much like the perpetual incense offering in the temple in Israel. There's this incense going up to God, and this incense carries with it the prayers of the saints. And so everybody gets silent. Why? So God can hear the prayers of his people as he gets ready to act. And what we're going to see is God is going to get ready to act in response to the prayers of his people, to vindicate his people. This is one thing that God's judgments accomplish. They vindicate the people of God, who we have seen in the book of Revelation already, have been martyred, persecuted, imprisoned, ostracized, and exiled for the name of Jesus. And you may remember when we were in Revelation chapter 6 a couple of weeks ago, the Apostle John saw underneath the altar in heaven a group of martyrs who had been killed for their faith during the tribulation. And do you remember what they were praying? Let me remind you again. He says, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They say, God, when are you going to judge the violence and the, the murder that the world has done to your people? And these saints are crying out along with the blood of all of those who have been killed for the name of Jesus. They cry out along with all of those who have been imprisoned and persecuted for centuries for vindication. God, when are you gonna do something? God, how long will you stand by and do nothing? And the answer is, just wait a little longer. Well, here we are. Revelation 8 and 9, and this judgment begins. Now, we do not, in our nation very often, think a lot about persecution. 
And part of that is because at this period of time in history, we might be made fun of, we might lose some social standing, we might experience a little bit of social isolation, but up to this point in this country, none of us are being imprisoned, none of us are being martyred, none of us are being uh, chased down and killed or our families killed for the sake of the gospel. And yet around the world to this day, that is still happening to Christians as it has been happening to Christians throughout history. Uh, I read this week an organization called Open Doors that they do a lot of research on Christian persecution. They said last year, just under 6,000 Christians were murdered for following Jesus. The majority of those were in Nigeria. In North Korea alone, tens of thousands to this day are in prison for following Jesus. Around the world, roughly one in eight Christians lives in a country where they face extreme persecution. That means they face the threat of losing their life, of going to prison, of losing any ability to support themselves economically because they can't get a job because they follow Jesus. This persecution is real. And so throughout all of the centuries, God's people have cried out for justice. And what we see, as we said at the beginning, if God never brings justice, then he's not kind. If he never rights the wrongs that have accrued to his people, that's not a loving God. You and I know, of course, if we're walking down the street and we see a person being beaten, attacked, or abused, and we do nothing, and that person never faces consequences, they'd say, you did something wrong. You're not righteous. You're not loving, you're not kind. God judges because of his love to vindicate his people. Most of us would probably agree that if not the greatest travesty, the greatest atrocity of the 20th century, certainly one of the greatest atrocities of the 20th century, definitely in the Western world, was the Holocaust during World War II, where, where the Nazis slaughtered some six million innocent Jews. And after the war, you may know this, some of those who were involved in that atrocity, they escaped justice. They fled to other countries. They fled to other regions. They went into hiding and they escaped justice. Now, what's interesting is if you go and you, you read articles today, uh, to this day, the governments of Germany and Europe, they are trying to bring to justice some of the last living Nazis in the world. They're trying to bring them to prosecution because these men and women are getting old. They're 100 years old plus, and so they want them to come to justice for the sake of the relatives of the Holocaust survivors before these people can die a peaceful death. And in fact, I read about one just this past week. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a man named Herbert Waller, a 100-year-old man now. He was a member of what was called the Einsatzgruppen, which was a mobile killing unit responsible for the death of 30,000 Jews, his unit alone. He came up on charges, but they dropped the charges due to lack of evidence. Now, what was interesting was on his 100th birthday, a group of relatives of Holocaust victims gathered at his house to protest and to cry for justice. Why are they unkind? Are they vindictive? Are they mean? No. It's because a world without justice isn't a world we want to live in. And what we're going to see in this passage is, is a world described of people filled with violence, idolatry, the worship of demons, sexual immorality, and abuse. And God says a world without justice is not the kingdom that I'm building. So he moves to vindicate his people. God's justice springs from his mercy and his grace. And I wanna say this, that we know in Jesus Christ that even the hardest heart and even the worst sinner has the hope of eternal life. If a person turns to Jesus and finds shelter in his death and resurrection on behalf of their sins, they receive eternal life as a free gift. But we will also see 
that there are those who refuse, who simply will not bow the knee to Jesus voluntarily. And so when we get to passages like this, we see God saying, okay, enough. Justice will be served on those who refuse to bow the knee. So God's judgment vindicates his people. Secondly, we're gonna see it also displays his power, displays his power. Follow with me as we continue in chapter eight, verse six, uh, excuse me, verse five, which I didn't read a moment ago. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So this censer that holds the prayers of the saints for justice, now he fills it with fire and he casts it to the earth. And there's a, there's a huge storm. Verse six, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Let me pause. Wormwood was a poisonous type of bush. It was a bitter and poisonous bush. So the idea is all the waters become poisonous to drink. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. In other words, if things haven't yet gotten bad enough, They're about to get worse. These uh, first four trumpet judgments are reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. So if you read those and you thought all of this sounds vaguely familiar, that's because the plagues of Egypt were very similar, particularly the first plague, the seventh plague, the eighth plague, and the ninth plague will be reiterated here in chapters eight and nine. Trumpet one calls to mind the seventh plague, which was hail upon the earth and upon the vegetation. Trumpets two and three call to mind the first plague where all the waters of Egypt were turned to blood. Trumpet four calls to mind this ninth plague where there was darkness over the land. And so, so we have a recapitulation of the plagues on Egypt. Why is this happening? What was the point of the plagues on Egypt? Well, surely to to get uh, Pharaoh to let the people go. That, That was true. God was pressing on Pharaoh to get him to let God's people go. But there was something else. Those plagues displayed that when you're up against the power of God, you can't win. Remember the Egyptians, they worshiped a bunch of little gods that controlled the sky and the, and the crops and the earth and their health and the rivers and all of these things. And plague after plague after plague, God says, your gods are nothing compared to the power of Yahweh. And so God displays his power over the gods of nature and in fact over the kings of the earth. Exodus chapter nine, he says to Pharaoh, I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. I have allowed you to remain, Pharaoh, in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. And what we see is as these plagues come, Pharaoh hardens his heart against God, says, I will not let them go. I will not submit. Who is God? And God says, I'll show you who I am. And he steps in with another plague. And Pharaoh says, okay, I'll let him go. And then he says, nope, just kidding. And he hardens his heart again. Who is God? God says, I'm the maker of the earth. I'm the one who spoke the stars and the sun and the moon into existence. I'm the one who causes the crops to grow. I'm the one who keeps you alive. I'm the one who gave you your authority, Pharaoh. And I can take it away. 
Who is Yahweh? Yahweh is the all-powerful, all-sovereign creator and ruler of everything you see. Here in Revelation, we see a similar set of plays. Designed to leave no doubt, God's in control of nature. And then these plagues are gonna go on and we're gonna see God is gonna leave no doubt that not only is, does he control the natural world, he controls the supernatural realm as well. Not only what you see here on earth, but what is in heaven and even what is in hell. All right, so we're about to read what is a very unusual passage here. But I want you to see, we move now to what's called the first woe, the, the, the fifth of these trumpet judgments, and, and it's preceded by this eagle flying through the sky, and he says, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. He is announcing God's judgment, and he is also warning. Turn to God now, because if you thought it was bad now, it's about to get worse. Chapter nine, starting in verse one, then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men of God who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months." And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon. Both of those, by the way, mean destroyer. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Let me pause there. You okay? okay. Here's what we're gonna see. There's this terrible locust plague that seems to come from the abyss itself. The abyss is a place we'll see a few times throughout the rest of the book. The abyss is a holding place for Satan and all of the fallen angels as they await judgment. God sends an angel with a key who unlocks that abyss and out from the abyss come these demonic locusts. Some people have speculated, well maybe this was John trying to describe helicopters or something like that and he was just too primitive to know what he was seeing. That's not what's going on. And the reason I can say that is because the text actually tells us what this is. These are demonic beings that flow from the abyss and God is saying, look, if you want to worship demons, which we're gonna see later in the passage, the people of earth are worshiping idols and they're worshiping demons. He goes, you're trusting in these idols and these demons to save you from my wrath. Guess what? They're not on your side. The demons will destroy you. And so they come up out of the pit and you have this locust plague. Now throughout the scripture, locust plagues, just like the eighth plague on Egypt, locust plagues, were one of the ways God judges. In the book of Joel, the prophet describes a locust plague. He says, what the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten, and what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten, and what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. A nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. So there is some comparison between these two passages, except in Revelation, it's now intensified. This was a bad locust plague in Joel. The one that comes here is supernaturally bad. And you have an army of these demonic locusts that move with military formation and strength, wearing armor and looking like a terrible army. And notice they don't go after the vegetation they go after the people. Normally locusts are strict vegetarians. You probably know that. They destroy the crops. Here they torture the people 
with a sting that is like a scorpion's sting. I probably shouldn't admit this, but once or twice in the last couple of months, we have found scorpions here in our building. There was one in our office bathroom a couple of weeks ago, uh, one uh, somewhere else in the building that I won't talk about, but, but we have found <laughs> scorpions here in the building. And it's a little scary. No one wants to be stung by a scorpion. Most people won't die from it. But you might wish you did. They hurt. So God sends this army that torments, notice, only those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads, only those who have not trusted in Jesus. That is significant. There's a group of people in agonizing pain. And then there's another group of people, they're fine because they've taken shelter in the King of Kings. They've gone to Jesus for grace and mercy. And then the sixth woe, which I'm gonna read here as well. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. Literally, John says twice, 10,000 times 10,000. He says, I heard the number of them. Uh, By way of comparison, the largest army in the world today is the army of North Korea. At least that's their reported numbers. About 8 million people in their armed forces. Imagine 200 million. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. So these four angels standing at the Euphrates River. The Euphrates uh, runs through uh, Syria today and is east of the nation of Israel. Often invading armies would come from that direction. So these four angels are standing at the Euphrates and they are pulled back. God says, release them. And they let go. And this army of 200 million horsemen comes through and destroys a third of mankind. That's the second woe, the sixth trumpet. Massive death on a global scale. So what we have is God says, I control the natural world. I control the supernatural. You want to look somewhere for shelter and help? I want you to look around and see that those who have trusted in Christ, they have the seal of God on their foreheads. That's the people been talked about last week, and nothing touches them. Nothing comes near them. God says, I want you to understand, in the face of all of my power, you cannot win. Uh, I I saw an article uh, just recently with this headline that intrigued me, eight loving ways to show your kid you're the boss thought, man, you know, at first glance, that seems like an interesting turn of phrase, right? Right? You say to your kid, hey, I'm going to show you I'm the boss in a loving way, in a nice way, right? And so it goes on, and I won't go through all of the eight, but one quote from it stood out to me. Uh, They interviewed a parenting expert, which I don't know how one becomes such a thing, but they said this, in the face of a defiant child... You, you do need to demonstrate that you're in charge. And so this parenting expert says, you have to stay neutral and strong like an oak tree, just rooted in the ground with kids like this. And I thought, man, what a great concept that I think most of us have failed to do adequately over time. What, what are they saying? If you have a defiant child, a child who pushes back, a child who won't listen, a child who always has to win, a child who wants to be in charge, you need to be strong like an oak tree and show them who's in charge. Now, whether you agree with that philosophy or not, it does illustrate that there are some people that, that have to learn the hard way. Many of you, you go, yeah, every family's got a kid like that. There are some people that have to learn the hard way. 
And even then, they won't bow the knee. So all of this judgment is being launched from heaven, and it's clear that it's coming from God. He says, I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to show you what I can do as a final attempt to convince you to take shelter in me. So what we see is that these judgments, they vindicate God's people, they display his power, and then thirdly, here's, here's what they do, is ultimately they expose human hearts. The last two verses, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Despite all the evidence, clear evidence, that God is behind these judgments, people won't bow. They won't trust in Christ. They won't turn away from their sin. They cling to their rebellion. One thing this highlights, by the way, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the problem of unbelief is not primarily a problem of lack of information. It's not primarily an ignorance problem. It's a stubbornness problem. It's the Harry R. Truman that lives inside each of us and says, nothing's going to hurt me. I can be in control. I can run my own life apart from God. I don't need forgiveness. I don't need Jesus. The problem is not ignorance. It's stubbornness. This is why sometimes when we ask, well, what, what, what does God do about people who have never heard about Jesus, and yet they're really, they're really good people, and yet they've never heard about Jesus? What we see from the Scripture is, is the testimony of the Scripture is that's what we call a straw man. That those who long to know God, those who respond, you see this in Romans 1, those who respond to the evidence of creation and the evidence of their conscience and move toward the God that made all of creation rather than moving away from him into idolatry and immorality, those who move toward him, God responds almost, in, in fact, invariably in the scripture by giving them more information and more information and more information until they know Jesus. There are biblical illustrations of this, for example, with Cornelius in Acts 10. And I could give you modern illustrations of this well, of people born in completely non-Christian nations with not a church in a thousand miles of them who began to ask questions and seek the true God and reject the idolatry of their youth. And God sends them messengers. The problem is not ignorance. The problem is stubbornness. God knows our hearts, and he is gracious according to what he knows about our hearts and our minds. That's why Proverbs 15, 11 says, Sheol, that's, that's the underworld, the grave, Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of men. These judgments expose who people are, and this constant desire to try to go up against God even though we know we can't win. I've, I've mentioned this before, but uh, one of my favorite movie franchises is the Rocky movies. I've watched all 27 or however many of them that there are. I've seen them all. And, uh, you know, one thing everybody admires, of course, about Rocky is his, his perseverance. So I, I'm going to give this away, but many of you know, in the first movie, he doesn't win. He doesn't win the fight against Apollo Creed, the, the champion of the world. Uh, he loses by decision. He goes the distance and he loses by decision. So in the second movie, he comes back and he wins. He's victorious. And we cheer for his perseverance and his grit. And then from then on, pretty much in every movie, he wins or his protege wins. But imagine if there really were 27 or 30 or 40 movies and he always loses. At what point would you say your perseverance has crossed the boundary into stupidity? I read actually about a real life 
boxer by the name of Christian Late, who is one of the most losingest boxers in history. He boxed for 15 years, just retired a couple of years ago. 300 fights, he lost 279 of them. And then he never knocked anybody out. He won a couple of them by decision. And so they, they interviewed him about, like, why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep stepping in the ring? And, of course, the answer was money. But in the context of that, he says, quote, I won't lie. Sometimes I go home and I put my head in my hands. What am I doing? Losing, losing, losing. And that was the end of the quote. <laughs> and I thought, but at least he got money. In Revelation 8 and 9, you see humanity rebellious against God. And you know what they're doing? Losing, losing, losing. And we see this isn't grit. This isn't perseverance. This isn't an independent streak. This is foolishness and a heart of rebellion. God's judgments lay open their hearts and our hearts they also provide a final opportunity for people to turn to Jesus. Because as, as the judgments are raining down, there's only one place you can find shelter, and it's in Jesus Christ. One of the beautiful images in Revelation 6, we mentioned it a moment ago, is that the saints who are crying out for justice in God's throne room, did you, did you ever notice where they were? They're under the altar. They're under the altar not only to indicate that their sacrifice is not meaningless, but they're literally under the altar, covered by the blood, sheltered by the blood of Jesus. They're protected. They're safe under the altar. That's where safety comes from. That's where mercy is found. All of the grace that we need to escape the judgment of God is found simply by turning to him and saying, I, I believe in Jesus Christ who died in my place. He gave his blood on my behalf and rose from the dead so I can have eternal life. So again, as, as we study this passage, I, I think it causes us to ask a couple of questions. And, and here in a moment, we're going to close with communion. And as we're preparing for communion, I want us in a moment to do again what we did at the beginning. We're going to have a moment of silence. Might even be a little bit longer. But during this moment of silence, as we're preparing for communion, a couple of things I want us to do. Acknowledge God's power and holiness. Have you been taking God Lightly. Or have we viewed him with the reverence he is owed? With the seriousness he is owed? And so I, I want us to acknowledge God's power and say, God, I, I trust your sovereignty and power over the natural world, over the supernatural world, over my life. And then thank him for giving us shelter in Jesus. If you don't know him through Jesus Christ this morning, I would encourage you, take this opportunity. Take this opportunity to say, God, I trust in you that Jesus Christ died for my sins, that he rose from the dead. And I wanna have eternal life in a kingdom free from injustice and violence and abuse and immorality, but in a kingdom filled with your love and your grace. If you don't know him, feel free to let the elements pass or don't take them this morning. But if you do, as we are taking this moment of silence, thank him for offering shelter in Jesus.